Welcome everyone to the Televisor and Learning Design webinar this month. We've combined those special interest groups to look in detail today at visual approaches to curriculum and learning design. And we have three great business schools who've lent us their presenters. Uh, and we'll hear from one now. So our third presenter, is Mitchell Osmond. Hi, Mitchell. Lovely to see you there. Hello. Um, and you, you're, we can hear you well, I think. I hope so. Sound good. Yes, that's perfect volume. Lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Mitchell. He's the Teaching and Learning Manager of the Business School at the University of Technology, Sydney. And he's been working there for some time, since um, 2012. UTS Mitchell was also where you obtained your master's degree. And that's where I got mine, so good choice. Um, Mitchell has um, given his presentation the subtitle, Using Visualisations in the Process of Assuring Student Learning Across the Curriculum and Mapping for Continuous Improvement Processes. Um, and this is I found that really characteristic of business as a field, that that um, focus on quality assurance is, is part of it. So it's great to hear, Mitchell, you with, with, with these other people from the same area. And um, please, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Well, as everyone, thank you um, for, for in sharing the invite and, uh, and having me along. I'll just start sharing my screen. So hopefully you can all see that title, Visualising the Curriculum. It's just all... coming up. That's great. Just coming up? Yeah. Perfect. Great. Okay. So thank you for the introduction, Penny. Uh, as you said, uh, Teaching Learning Manager for the UTS Business School, where, you know, we use just a couple of smaller scale uh, visualisation techniques to, to really look at how we're assuring learning across our curriculum. And by way of sort of kicking us off um, and, uh, and sharing what that assurance of learning process looks like, um, it's multi-tiered and it's, it's based on a constructive alignment from our graduate attributes, stretching down through our program learning goals and program learning objectives, which are also known as our silos, course intended learning objectives, um, and then down into the subjects where subjects set their own learning objectives uh, and assessments and teaching and learning activities. And the assurance of learning sort of situates itself around that end of the process in the assessment um, part. Uh, and continuous improvement is then delivered through a process of closing that loop. So uh, reflecting back on this entire uh, acquisition of um, the program learning objectives by the students. And overall, the AOL process uh, enables us to answer questions like, what will our students be like when they graduate? Uh, what will they learn through our program? And what are our expectations of their learning? How will they learn it? How will, they know, how will we know whether they've learned it or not? And what do we do about uh, students who are not actually learning what it is that we're trying to get out? And the answer to those questions really sets us up to judge how well the business school is fulfilling its educational aims, allows for that continuous improvement of programs and subjects, um, and also assures our key stakeholders that our school is actually fulfilling its mission in providing this education to students. So to kick us off into this visualisation, um, this is an example of our curriculum maps that we produce. And it's, it's a dummy version, but it's based on a postgraduate program um, where we have set out our graduate attributes here at the top. Uh, each program um, within that will set their own program learning objectives written uh, to match these graduate attributes. But then where the real visualisation comes in is this middle table where we set out all of the subjects that are core within this program and then map whether or where and how they help develop or assure uh, the program learning objectives within students. So for each of the subjects in the core, they are mapped against the program learning objectives and the graduate attributes across the top. Um, in a sequential order to ensure that students have the opportunities to develop 
these capabilities before we assure that they've actually developed them towards the end of a program, normally in and around a capstone, but not uh, limited to. So we can have other sort of later year subjects that come in and do some assurance at the end. Um, these maps we hand over to the program directors. Uh, they update them, they maintain them um, as they um, change and evolve subjects and programs. Typically, those changes would happen either at the end of a year or at the start of a year and not in between semesters. So in terms of ensuring um, equivalence for a whole year's worth of delivery, if we're running a subject multiple times throughout that year, we don't allow for changes to happen in the middle of that because that kind of messes with the metrics and data that we get at the end. Um, so end or start of a, of a year would be the changes. Um, what this sort of demonstration allows the subject coordinators to see, so below the program di uh, directors, the subject coordinators really get a sense of where their subject sits within that larger program and understands how they actually connect to that overall story and learning that the students are going through, you know, across a, an undergraduate or a postgraduate degree. Um, but it gives them the opportunity to work with other subject coordinators within that uh, program learning objective to ensure that they're setting up a scaffolding of this particular program learning objective in their own subject ways, but enables it to, to build on in the next subjects uh, before students get um, assessed on it towards the end. Um, You'll note also in this map that uh, the assurance that happens at the end is specifically detailing the assessment in which this is going to occur. That's to enable us to um, extract data from these particular assessment types that I'll go into in some detail, but also builds that information um, forward. And at the bottom here, you can see a table of other core subjects um, so these are opportunities where the core subjects don't necessarily develop or assure anything in particular, but will still link into a program learning objective and therefore a graduate attribute. So it just extends the mapping and the visualisation that these subjects are still doing something within the program overall, even if they're not fulfilling some form of physical obligation to a student in their program learning objectives. And just for further sort of showing, this is an undergraduate program. So where this differs is in our core subjects in our first year, we actually introduce um, these program learning objectives. So when students come into a postgraduate degree, we make some assumptions that they've already been introduced to the, the basic concepts of communication, um, uh, creative thinking, business knowledge and concepts, and those base graduate attributes that we don't need to uh, reintroduce at a postgraduate program. So they're mapped to introduce in our first year core of this undergraduate degree. But then where this differs is that of course, a, an undergraduate degree um, and some postgraduate degrees will have multiple majors and streams and different options and opportunities for students to work their way through and, and diversify their own learning. All of that gets mapped um, within the one program. So. Um, students will uh, complete eight core subjects in this first year of the undergraduate and then move into a major or specialisation, which then takes on the task of developing and assuring. But say a student chose a second or a different major than this one, that too still gets mapped. So it shows the connection uh, that all students are going to be introduced, developed and assured on every single PLO that the school offers. So I mentioned that uh, this assessment directly ties into um, pulling data. And what we do with that data is, is report on that at the end of semesters and at the end of years. And so we produce um, data in the way of graphs that gets shared back to uh, our subject coordinators and our program directors that shows whether a student has exceeded so this blue category, met, our expectations or fallen below on any of these expectations around our program learning objectives. So that data that comes from those assuring subjects is really being presented back to them um, through this process to show and give real strong insights of what subject, uh, what students have actually been achieving within these subjects that they might not normally get. Um, and the reason for this is that we tie the assurance of the program learning objective to maybe just one or, or more uh, assessment criteria within an assessment. So a student might, um, might get a high distinction 
within a particular assessment that this program learning objective is tied to, but they've actually failed to understand and demonstrate their um, knowledge and understanding of a particular program learning objective. So they might actually fall below, but we won't see that in the wider picture of the assessment because overall they've actually you know, done quite well. So this really helps hone in and, see, and show those sorts of issues that might not be surfacing through just looking at assessment results. Um, so subject coordinators and program directors are provided with this student achievement data at the end of each session or at the end of the year. Um, we use this for reporting purposes. Um, and so they'll take this graphical information as well as other inputs to review their subjects uh, or their programs in relation to things like subject content and assessment design as it supports student learning. Um, the reporting also then gets them to um, propose actions and outcomes for making improvements to, to change um, what we're seeing here in, the, um, uh, in, in acquiring these program learning objectives. Um, and allows them to, to investigate further. So, you know, I use this as an example predominantly because uh, you can see in this particular year in this subject, you know, we had almost 50% of students falling below our expectations on a particular program learning objective, which is quite stark and, and interesting to see. But it's using this visual information that actually enables us to dig into the subject and say, right, where is this information coming from? Um, and it transpires that this was actually um, being taken from a final exam where uh, students obviously under time constraints have selected to simply just skip over this particular question, uh, not answered it. So students therefore are not demonstrating any sort of learning around this particular PLO. And that sort of let us sort of reflect as a faculty to make some change and say, ah, oh, hang on a minute, maybe final exams aren't exactly the best place for these sorts of things and let's look at other mechanisms by which we can measure uh, students' um, uh, achievements. Um, so beyond subject and program level, it also lets us collect this data um, and aggregate it at faculty levels where we can look at trends across a number of years. So we can see that the achievements um, have been increasing across 17, 18, 19 on this particular graduate attribute, um, but also lets us to, to sort of slice and dice the, the data in different ways and present it back. Um, for example, um, benchmarking all of our undergraduate programs against each other for having exceeded expectations on students, where you can see programs, you know, one, two and four relatively around the same mark across um, the programs, but we have some exceptional high uh, achievers here in, in the third undergraduate program. And so what's going on there? Is it an assessment design fail? Is it um, uh, the way the teaching is happening? Are they just marking too nicely? Um, little issues like that. So the, all of this graphical representation just helps us to dig into the issues that we're seeing um, and come up with some recommendations for how we might fix and, uh, and change the design on those things. Um, the overall assurance of learning process in producing these graphs um, is, is rather lengthy, it's time consuming and um, relies a lot on subject coordinators giving uh, my team in teaching learning the information we need to be able to, to produce these things and investigate further. So uh, UTS as a whole um, over the last couple of years has now moved to a new learning management platform, which is Canvas. And a new uh, thing that we found when we actually got into Canvas was this outcomes slash learning mastery, it's what it's called. Um, and so we've actually been piloting the use of this across uh, 2021 to um, speed up the process of assuring learning and give the information back to the academics or our subject coordinators uh, much, much faster. So um, this is a new sort of frontier for us and how we're building um, understanding and inputs around the assurance of learning. Um, the way this outcomes works is that within the speed grader, so within the marking section of uh, Canvas, you can build a rubric uh, directly to it. And what we do is we actually attach this program learning objective here directly into the rubric that ties with this particular um, criteria above it. So as a marker comes through and they've marked uh, students against the core content and research um, to be exceeds, meets or below, um, when they come down and mark their critical analysis, 
um, all they need to do is if the student succeeded on this particular criteria, they just click the same box below it against the program learning objective. And what that does is feed into this learning mastery information and graphical information that shows a, a instantaneous snapshot of how these students are going. So where they, they might find that 20% of students have failed to understand or demonstrate uh, uh, this particular learning objective, it means that they can address that within their classes instantaneously. They can change what they're doing the next week to, um, or over the next few weeks, uh, to, to bring students who have fallen below up to speed, see if they can make some improvements before moving them on um, to any sort of assuring level as they, as they go through. So that's kind of the new frontier, a little more exciting for us, a little more um, speedier. And um, the brilliant part is that as a teaching and learning uh, administrator, uh, this all just speaks to the back end of Canvas where I can download everything. So I'm no longer reliant on uh, academics sharing all of this information with me and having to call and repeat and, and chase them for these sorts of things. Uh, and we can give them this information uh, much, much faster. So the, the last sort of visualization that we have is um, around the assessment audit mapping. Um, so this particular tool that we've created, it's Excel based, um, just allows a user to document all of a subject's assessments within a program. So across the, the left hand side, they'd list all of the core subjects, all of the elective subjects, and this one has a capstone. And then they get to plot out, well, what types of assessments are they actually using within this program? Um, and this is just to give them an insight into what the student assessment experience actually looks like. Um, but it's also really useful for program teams. Um, you know, often people who are just teaching within subjects can, can become siloed and not sort of see, well, what's happening within a program outside of their own subject. They just see, you know what, this is my subject, this is how I'm assessing students, um, and I don't really have time um, to be able to build beyond that um, and see what everyone else is doing to know what's, what's going on. So this particular example uh, was part of a large project within one of our departments um, where we knew that there was a lot of group projects going on. Um, we know that they use a lot of final exams, but it wasn't until someone actually built this audit that you can see this very stark, every single subject is pretty much using a quiz, a group project and, an, and a final exam. And it's not until you can set this out and present this back to subject coordinators that they get this realization of, oh, this isn't great. And our student experience really needs to change to ensure that students are getting a diversity of assessment options that really links into some authenticity and some real world application uh, beyond just understanding and demonstrating knowledge within quizzes and final exams. Um, so, um, you know, it's information that gets presented through this that comes back into sort of my team where we can run some ideation workshops around authentic assessment to, you know, give academics that creative outlet in going, okay, if a student's going to walk out of my subject straight into the workforce, what are they going to be expected to know? How can I actually do things differently? So what we should be seeing over the next year as this information gets digested and changed is this other category where we actually have some really great examples of um, authentic uses of assessment. Uh, evaluation, simulations, some real projects that they can sink their teeth into, and less of the quizzes, final exams and group projects. And so we'll hopefully, when I come back in 12 months time and remap this particular um, program, I'll see a good diversity of assessments that you know maybe targets the quizzes and final exams at particular subjects where there's threshold concepts that students absolutely need to know, but elsewhere, students have an abundance of choice and options. So that's, that's me, um, um, happy to take questions and um, go from there. Thanks very much, Mitchell. So good to see um, good to see you doing things the hard way and then the easy way. That's a, a great story to show us. And um, also, yes, that aspect of diversity <clears throat> for the learning ecosystem. So we've got that so, so important and sustainability as well. Um, so that they can keep keep building and improving incrementally or as, as quick as they can. Um, thanks so much, Mitchell. We'll thank you in the chat. There have been a lot of positive comments for all of our presenters. We have still 10 minutes or so for questions. If anybody would like to pose them, Kashmira, I don't know if you'd like to come in 
on the learning design angle, but we've seen a great variety there. Yeah, uh, a visual uh, visual aspect is uh, is a core of learning design, but there are other aspects as well. Uh, I just have a small question for Deva uh, and and um, uh, her team. Uh, so, do you collect uh, the patterns from other uh, other people who created the patterns as well? Because I have few created uh, initially when I was to do my pattern book. So, uh, do you accept that, or you you only include yours? Uh, at this moment, we are learning from other patterns, but we are only including ours because our focus is on learning at scale, and that is where we actually position our patterns. Uh, and we have large units we are working with. Uh, some of our units are um, two thousand, two two and a half thousand students. So, uh, what we deal with um, in terms of learning and teaching might have slight um, uh, differences with others, but of course there are lots of uh, synergies happening with other patterns as well. But we are focusing on learning at scale, learning and teaching mm -hmm. at scale. Andrew, would you like to add? Um, yes, yeah, I, th I think at, at this stage we're um, uh, still putting together our, our ideas and, and trying to distill the essence um, of what we're seeing, um, but it's an active discussion in the team how to engage other people like yourself. Um, it, it could be an interesting one, um, maybe a question back to you whether the learning design SIG, um, you, you know, it, it has design patterns been an active sort of discussion there or is it more something you were personally interested in? And, just yeah, I mean, uh, uh, because we have like 55 people here listening, I, I just want to take that opportunity to say uh, we we took over learning design SIG uh, only like about a few months ago and there have been like COVID, so there is nothing um, uh, very concrete um, in terms of meetings or, uh, you know, uh, in any line of um, uh, communication or or any other things devised as such, but now that Escalate is uh, has provided the platform to us and we are planning to um, develop some channels and, and handing over those channels to uh, the the learning design SIG members to to handle so that they have resources or, or communications research papers or their design practices can be shared under particular um, so we will be developing it. So you, if you're part of Learning Design SIG, you will hear that communication very soon. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Kashmir. Thanks, Andrew and Dean. Yeah. Uh, Tracy has a question uh, in the chat for Michelle, asking yeah. about getting the information out, out of Planner. Um, does it have good reporting functions so that you can distribute those around? Um, you can, um, thanks Tracy, you can export the uh, the entire plan to Excel. So I've been experimenting with that as well to just say output all um, the, the learning outcomes for those high level discussions with the coordinator, for example. Um, so yeah, um, it can, um, it can do that. But um, yeah. Thanks, excellent. Very good. So great examples for us from business, which we can all have a think about in our own fields. Um, I want to thank again all four presenters for great, um, great overview, great information for us today. It's been lovely to have you and um, we look forward to learning more about your processes as you develop it. Thanks, thanks to everybody who's who's still here, who was able to come. Yeah. Thank you everyone from all of us.